who uh, has been working with me and others uh, on a volunteer uh, uh, committee to promote solar in this region, which some of you have already heard about. I've seen a couple of you are the beneficiaries of the solar panels that we've been promoting. So Kevin has become really an expert on solar. He's going to He's advocating for renewable energy and electric transportation policies for the Illinois State Legislature and the local governments. He's going to explain the status of renewable energy in Illinois and in the Metro East. So let's welcome Kevin. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks to the Sierra Club for inviting me to do this tonight. It's always good to come up here at all and uh, partake in the old bakery breweries. Too, by the way. Um, so can you all hear me well enough? I'm not used to using the microphone, usually I just speak without one, but I'll do my best. And if you have trouble hearing me, because I tend to do this a lot, without the microphone, just do this and I'll get the message. Might be better so, yeah, my name is, again, is Kevin McKee. I am a volunteer, as Chris mentioned, for several organizations that promote renewable energy uh, across the state one of which is the Illinois Solar Energy Association, and another of which is the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. There's that latter organization, MREA, that Chris and I are both participating to bring that annual program, along with other volunteers like Virginia back there, and Nate's not here tonight, and some others who aren't here tonight, I think, right? So, uh, at any rate, by volunteer, I mean volunteer uh, for these programs for these organizations. I don't uh, make any money. I don't make any money promoting solar energy. Uh, I've been offered speakers, stipends, and things like that. I turn them down because I feel that my independence uh, as a, an advocate is important. It's important for me to maintain a level of integrity that goes beyond uh, any money to do it. So I, I refuse any money. And I feel like audiences, when I speak to them, make them understand that they listen better and that uh, the legislators, when I represent up in Springfield and elsewhere, also pay more attention to what I have said. So, uh, I went to it. Well, this quote, by the way, I, I'm not sure about the entire, that's entirely accurate. The author who wrote the book that reported that wrote it many decades after the death of Edison, uh, but I still like to put it up there. Uh, allegedly, he was on his deathbed when he said that some 80 or 90 years ago, that long ago. So we've been working at it that long, and we took it a long way to go, as I hope that I'll show you tonight. So we'll talk about where we are in the Metro East in Illinois. Before we get to that, we'll talk a little bit about where we are in the U.S. I'll show you a few charts. I don't mean to bore you with numbers too much, but to get to an understanding of where we are and how much we've got yet to do, that's what it takes to get us here. And I'll hope to give you a little bit of perspective if I don't trip on the court and kill myself uh, throughout the briefing. And we'll put things in perspective so it's easier to understand how much work we have to do. Before we begin, let me take a quick poll. How many of you, how many of you out there do not yet have solar energy or renewable energy but want it? Raise your hand. A good number. Good, okay. Um, how many of you know that, at least in the Amherst territory, if you want, Renewable energy, you can subscribe to a different energy provider through Amazon and get it through your power bills. A few of you? Okay, good, good. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. I won't go into a whole lot of details about some of those programs. I'll do that in another uh, briefing I do for the ISEA. I'm doing a webinar for that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. I can give you some more information about that after the program if you'd like to learn more about the real nuts and bolts rather than just the status. Um, how many of you have solar power? So, okay, about maybe a third or more. Those of you who want it but don't have it, maybe make notice of those of you who do have it. We raise your hands again and consult with them after the show and uh, show. I won't go into the piece of gold as part of the show. It's a nice presentation. And uh, maybe have a chat with them about how it's working for them. I'll be glad to talk to you as well. So one of the questions I get asked every now and then is, do we get enough sunlight to make this work in Illinois? And I'll tell you, as far as I'm concerned, the answer is yes. I get about 65% of what I need for my house and my electric cars from the sun. 
I've got solar panels on my house. The last slide I'll show you in my house, what it looks like. Um, this map created by the Department of Energy shows how much solar energy is collected across the U.S. during the average year. As you would expect, this area out here in the west, southwest uh, U.S. gets the most sunlight. If you look on the scale down here, that's, that's the far end of the scale. The other end of the scale down here, they get the least amount of sunlight in places like Alaska and Washington State, where we have lots of clouds, right? Here in Illinois, we're somewhere in the middle of that scale. Um, so what I used to do, I use this same graphic for both organizations that belong to to help people understand where we are with respect to how much solar we have and how it can contribute to our energy security. How would you compare, just look at that map, the amount of sun power, sunlight we get across a year compared to some place like Miami, Florida. Miami, or Miami is a sun sun. A sun the sunshine state, right? Florida is a sunshine state. The girls said they're sun. It's got to be warm. They got beaches. The guesses? 50%? Mary has a guess. Looks like we're about the same. Sorry? About the same as Florida. About the same. Pretty close, indeed. Yeah, we get about 92 percent of the sunlight over the course of a year that Miami gets. Well, that's a pretty surprising number. I, I wouldn't have guessed that before I became a solar So sure, we get plenty of uh, sunlight around here. And I, if you want to talk to some of the guys who also have solar, you'll find from them I hope that uh, they have a similar opinion. We have Germany on here. Why do we have Germany on here? Well, it's because. They don't get a lot of sunlight. They look a lot like Alaska, right? Nevertheless, they built out their infrastructure so they have a lot of solar energy. And they export, they end up exporting on a sunny day their excess solar energy across the borders to other countries. That has brought with it a lot of challenges for them in terms of balancing their needs and their uses, um, and as well as working with the grid. Uh, hopefully we can take lessons from Germany and improve our own system so that we have a better balance of how to do business. So um, this graphic is what I created after consulting with another solar ambassador that is in the Illinois Solar Energy Association. Phil Guile lives over by Mahomet, Illinois, on the other side of the state. And he has both a wind generator and solar installation. And what I've tried to show you here with five years worth of data that he's provided me on monthly averages, um, the solar picks up very nicely in the summertime, and as you would expect, to have less of it in the winter. Right? Think of your February around here. It's been pretty gray and rainy and or uh, sleety, all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, though, his uh, wind energy is pretty strong in the wintertime, dips down in the summertime, pretty much opposite the solar energy coming in and picks back up again in the fall. So they really complement each other quite well. And that's uh, why we need to encourage a strong build out of wind here in the Midwest. Now I don't advocate that everybody go out and get a wind generator because I think that they're a lot of trouble uh, and they require more maintenance than solar energy does. Uh, Phil tells me he, he's about 80 now, I think. He tells me he installed the generator himself. It's on an 80-foot tower in his, uh, on his farm. And he decided he's too old to get up on the tower and maintain it anymore, so he hires somebody to come out for two and three or four hundred dollars a year to lubricate the bearings and all that stuff. I think, I think wind energy is a great thing if you get the roof for it. And if you've got the, uh, as long as you know, you've got to maintain it. Solar power, on the other hand, you don't have to do that stuff. It's close to the ground or it's on your roof. And you don't have to really do any maintenance beyond washing it off and pulling once a year. In the last 25 years with minimal maintenance. But just this graphic for, uh, to bring out that point that here in Illinois, these are our major renewable energy resources. That's what we're going to try to build out. And this is not, though, get down to the level, obviously, of hour by hour, day by day, day um, variability. So, there's that problem that you tend to. It looks great on a month-to-month -month basis across the year, but that there are times when we do have uh, lack of wind and lack of sun. So we have to build out storage and stuff like that, but that's really beyond the scope of our briefing. 
this just uh, sort of get across the idea that it means So, good news, solar power surging. As of 2018, the U.S. had 64 gigawatts worth of solar power. That's a huge number. It sounds, that's really exciting. I think it is. What do you, what do you all think? <laughs> sounds like a lot, right? A gigawatt. How much is a gigawatt? What the hell is a gigawatt anyway? <laughs> <laughs> you, you might recognize that from the movie Back to the Future, right? Uh, but the scenario was that this this Hendrick scientist have generated or have created a time traveling machine on a sports car in the morning that required something called 1.21 gigawatts of power to make it work. Well, the gigawatt is a billion watts, and you all know what watts are that unit of energy, the unit of power, or maximum uh, amount of power that a device draws, whether it's a light bulb or a motor or whatever. It's also the maximum amount of power that the generator produces, no matter what kind of generator it is. It might be solar panels. Solar panels these days are installed on the roof are about 300 watts a piece, maximum. If you've got a generator that you bought from Home Depot to back up your house with, it might be five to eight kilowatts. That's a thousand watts, five, 5,000 to 8,000 watts. Throughout this presentation, we'll be talking megawatts and gigawatts and beyond that as well. Then you got your watt hours and your kilowatt hours. That's basically that maximum instantaneous power use or production multiplied by the amount of time you use it. So if you've got a five kilowatt generator, you run it for five hours, you get 25 kilowatts. And that's all the math I'm going to do for you tonight. This is elementary school math that we'll be using here. So thank you, thank an elementary school teacher uh, that we got through that part without problems. So we'll be talking watt hours, kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours in terms of how much power plants produce or solar panels produce, terawatt hours, and even petawatt hours. That's the next level. We won't spend too much time on that. So that 64 gigawatts of power is enough to power about 12 and a half million homes across the U.S. A couple million solar projects already. That's grown substantially since mid-2018. And we're getting a new one about every two and a half minutes. So for the purposes of tonight's presentation, I'll be referencing full-scale power plants, including a nuclear reactor. Typically, a nuclear reactor is rated around one gigawatt. One billion watts, that's the maximum power to produce. Coal power plants, about the same size, typically, out there on the utility grid. This one down at Prairie State, Two power plants combined for a total of 1.2 kilowatts. Or gigawatts, excuse me. So, one point uh, to keep in mind is a lot of this infrastructure, and even some of the older versions of this, this is a new plant, the older versions that are out there, all that stuff's aging quickly, and we've got to figure out over the next few years what we're going to do about these. Some of the nuclear reactors are about 48 years old now, and they were designed for 40 years of lifespan. So, uh, a couple of quick graphics to show you how far we've come uh, in our energy usage. This chart since 1948 for U.S. energy usage shows a stark, I guess that's a blue line, isn't it? I thought it was black when I picked it. This blue line up here is coal. King was coal for a long time, came in about 2007. Then started dropping after that. That's in part to do to things like well, the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign, right? I, I don't remember when that started, but uh, that's a piece of that. So give yourselves a hand, Sierra Club. You know, good stuff. Making progress. On the other hand, it's also partly due to the fact that we've seen an increase in natural gas coming from fracking and out competing coal. We've seen that rising since mid 80s, late 80s, excuse me. We've got nuclear power here in Brown. They've been fairly stable for the past few years, but an awful lot of reactors are aging and they're going to have to be replaced, shut down in the next decade or so, I suspect. Then down here, we tend to have more of the renewable energies, small portions of what we use today. And again, a reminder, the nuclear plants built out way back here when I was in high school and college. Maybe some of you same. We'll take a, let me back up a minute. 
So the blue line here is wind energy in the U.S. Pretty steep growth curve since about 2007. And then barely presentable here is solar power, this red line right here. Let's take a closer look at those sources. Since about 1984, you can see the dramatic rise in wind power. And then solar power really has only been increasing since 2011, 2012. And what's the, what's the unit over there? 5,000, I think that's terawatt hours, trillion watt hours. Um, pretty substantial. Hydropower up here, pretty important source of power in the US. Not so much here in Illinois. We'll see that in a minute. And it, we really don't have too many sources that we can exploit there. Maybe some river water. Uh, they're not nearly the kind of power that you would get from Hoover Dam, say. Right? And of course, hydropower comes with its own environmental consequences for migrating fish and, and whatnot. So, uh, lastly, here's a pie chart for uh, U.S. energy production, showing you all that in a nutshell for the last year for which we have data available from the Department of Energy. Coal. Nearly a quarter of our use, natural gas uh, is now king. Nuclear energy about 20%. And the rest over here is renewable in this sector. A little bit of biogas, uh, landfill gas, oil, stuff like that over there. But solar 1.74% as of October and November. We're total renewable about a quarter of our energy budget on the grid. That's just the electric grid. If you combine nuclear energy, uh, that brings us up to about 57 and a half. Nuclear being a carbon-free source of energy, it's uh, going to be important, I think, as we deal with the uh, climate crisis. Uh, we want to do whatever we can to avoid emitting carbon in the atmosphere or getting methane in the atmosphere from natural gas leaks and that matter. Um, more about that in a bit. I may be the outlier here. Uh, I, as an environmentalist and as a renewable energy advocate, see that nuclear energy is going to be important for decades to come. We need it. We need to focus more on getting rid of this other stuff. That's going to be a huge battle. So, what does it look like for Illinois? Here we are with coal, about 25%. Uh, and then gas and oil, about 12.5%. For a total of 37 plus percent fossil fuel sources. Renewable energy, we got wind at about 7 percent. Uh, we keep seeing more wind generation in the north, especially in the state. We keep hoping to see more come down south. We don't have quite the level of wind resources down here, but with the newer technologies, more efficient turbines, uh, I think uh, we'll see that soon. Solar power, we just broke through the 1 percent barrier this year. Awesome, that's awesome. It's, we've got a long way to go though, right? Uh, we, just, we just broke through. And that's about 0.14 terawatt hours out of about 14.1 terawatt hours. All this from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Hydropower, pretty minuscule. There's some pumped hydro storage up near the lakes, Great Lakes. They uh, use excess power when it's cheap or whatever uh, at night or from renewable sources to pump it into a reservoir that's not too high and then they release it during the day or when they need it to generate a little bit more power. It's not a, we just don't have enough terrain in Illinois to make a lot of advantage of it. By law, we've got to have 25% renewable energy by 2025. We say 25 by 25 in, in our advocacy business. Um, but we're not there yet. What do we got? 9.1%. Long way to go. In five years, don't think we're going to get there unless the law changes to give us more incentives to build this infrastructure out. A little bit more about that later. Everybody hear me okay so far? Okay. So uh, now let's move on to the Metro East. Um, maybe why someone's here. There are lots of, lots of exciting things going on around the Metro East. We've got uh, schools going solar, we've got municipalities going solar, we've got um, fire departments. Fire departments going solar, and more than we can talk about here, hundreds of uh, projects, literally. First, I'll start out with solar schools. Um, I'm aware of five going on in the Metro East, and my Metro East, I define that as 
Madison County, St. Clair County, and Monroe County. So a couple of them in the Belleville area, the Harmony, Harmony MD School District. And then three of them, basically in my hometown of Troy, or nearby, Silver Creek Elementary, C.A. Henning Elementary, and St. Jacob Elementary. I visited one of those sites a couple of weeks ago to get the, some photography of the installation process. These are the solar panels going on the roof of uh, Silver Creek Elementary. We're going to have about 350 kilowatts worth of AC. Between three schools, I think they're planning, they're looking to save something like a million and a half bucks over the life of the systems. And these kind of systems typically last about 25 or so years. In this case, the system's going on the roof, but in the case of the other two elementary schools, in the Triad School District, they're going on fields next to the school. And I visited those sites, the clearings underway, but they haven't started installing the panels yet. We've also got uh, electric school buses coming. Three electric school buses for the elementary schools down there. Well, that's great, that's, that's tremendous, right? Uh, electric school buses being charged by solar power. Costing less, costing taxpayer less, um, producing fewer emissions. Those electric school buses uh, look like that. They're coming with chargers. I don't know what model that is, who manufactures that. Uh, I think they're about 24 passenger vehicles. The money for the buses, by the way, comes out of the Volkswagen settlement fund. Uh, the money that uh, the U.S. got from suing Volkswagen over their fraud on emissions for their diesel engines uh, is helping to build out our electric infrastructure in Illinois. Hope to see more of that. While we're talking about electric vehicles, um, this is kind of fun. Are we at a crossroads? Well, yeah, we're kind of at a crossroads. We're, we need to see more infrastructure out there to support electric vehicles if we want to see more electric vehicles on the road and reduce that pollution, right? So in the city of Troy, uh, the city council last year proposed um, putting in chargers at the intersection out there. We, if you're familiar with Troy, we've got the intersection of several major highways. There's I-55, I-70, I-270, um, Highway 40, and then there's State Road 162. All those crossroads interacting out there. And because of that, we've got hotels, we've got truck stops for lower restaurants. Uh, gas station, you name it. Whoops. And so last year was proposed to put in some electric vehicle chargers out there for, to encourage overnight stays for people who drive electric vehicles, or to encourage people who have electric vehicles just stop at least long enough to have a meal in your car. And that's what we really need to see build out across Illinois, say every 20 or 30 miles. It's like we have our gas stations, right? They need to be closer than they are today and more convenient. This particular one is going to be set up at um, the Holiday Inn Express. And it's a partnership between the city of Troy and Southwest Electric Cooperative. Uh, they're putting up part of the money for it. And it costs more than you think of it. I think the city was putting up something like thirty or fifty thousand dollars for their share. There'll be five chargers, two high voltage chargers, and three of them are going to be uh, level two chargers I believe. Mean, that many of us use for today's uh, shorter bridge days. So uh, very cool. It helps with the mayor of Troy knows electric vehicles. He owns a Tesla, so he's aware of these issues with trying to drive cross country and the need to charge. Uh, so he's been a supporter of that. We're going to do a ground a groundbreaking this week. I was invited to come out and uh, be a part of that. Look forward to that. Can you use solar panels to charge any of these EVs for the nighttime as well? Sure, yeah, I have solar panels on my house, and we tend to prefer to plug in during the day when the sun's shining. I don't have to, I can plug in any time. Uh, but I still, this is maybe beyond the night's presentation, but um, something called net metering makes it possible for us to export our excess solar energy we produce during the day out to the grid. We get credit for it, so that the credit comes back to us at night or on a cloudy day, and we get credit for the electric bills. Also, the, the EV charger he's talking about here is not going to be solar powered. No, there's no solar power for this particular charger. That's but the charge. school bus chargers that are being put in, those are going to be solar powered. Thank you. 
that, that's my wife Peggy back there. She Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there will be no solar panels on site, but um, as we bid on the infrastructure in Illinois, you know, if, if, assuming we never get even remotely close to 50 or 100 percent, that energy ultimately will come from those other sources. Swecky, by the way, is interested in installing chargers up and down their network along the highway system. Uh, this is the first step in that direction. So, more municipal related solar projects. Um, Chris mentioned uh, the Madison Fire Department, number two on that list there, 2017. These first two lines are older projects dating back as far as 2010. Uh, Willoughby Farm and uh, Splash City were the first ones I'm aware of in the area really doing solar big time. They get a substantial amount of power from solar. Good on Collins for moving in that direction. They, they like Troy and Godfrey, not Troy, excuse me. Godfrey and uh, where are we now? So, so, what, what is it? What town is this? <laughs> uh, and I did want to mention too that, that um, the Madison Fire Department was um, happened due to a, a U.S. Steel um, trust that the Sierra Club had some funding to do some air quality improvement um, projects in Troy, or I mean Madison, um, Granite, um, and Venice. So that was, they, there was about four solar projects that were connected to that U.S. Steel trust money. So that was kind of the early um, projects in the Metro East area. Great, I did not know that. Um, yeah, thank you. By the way, I forgot to mention, ask questions any time, that, that won't bother me. There'll be lots of time at the end as well, I hope. I mentioned, I mentioned that I'm a volunteer and I don't take money for what I do, but I occasionally take a beer. Thank you, Chris. So, this year and last year, solar in the parks has been a big thing in Madison County. 11 parks getting money, getting grant money from the county to offset their energy usage. Some of them are big projects, some of them are little projects. Uh, we've got some here in Troy. Troy Troy's really going main candy I don't know why that is. <laughs> well, this is an example of what's going in at Glen Carbon at Sean Park, 30 panel array. They do plan to have EV chargers for the IVs. And the parks are really a great place to put EV chargers. People are normally going to spend a couple of hours there, and it takes a little time to charge up. Um, so we can use them there, but I, I also uh, like to mention that we need them at those highway intersections like we saw earlier. So now where are we? Oh, this brings us to community solar. So uh, community solar is a concept wherein a landowner can partner with someone who, uh, a company that is in the development business for solar energy. They'll put a solar farm on that property, and then they'll make it available to anyone who needs solar energy, renewable energy. You don't have to put solar panels on your house. I had this question raised to me earlier, well, what about other options? And this is a great option that, that was permitted by the 2016 Future Energy Jobs Act here in Illinois. So in this case, we've got families who are subscribing to it, getting at least part of their energy. We've got businesses. Nonprofits, your church, your YMCA, or whatever, can also partake in this. They won't have to put solar panels on the roofs. Now, there are some purists out there who will say, well, yeah, you can't prove to me that those electrons are going to my house. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. But, you know, it, it's maybe kind of aspect, but I would argue, too, that um, this has no intrinsic value, right? It only has value if we believe it. So it's kind of the same with this, but what you're doing is helping build out the non-carbon non energy infrastructure within Illinois. The way this works, by the way, for billing purposes, you have no upfront fees, you have no hidden fees, you have no uh, contract fees, uh, early termination fees like that. It's just a bill that you get through your power bill, Cameron Power Bill. And it's only available right now to people who live in Ameren territory. So if you live in the co-op territory, sorry, I don't think this is available to me yet. Um, but it's a great deal for people who live in an apartment or a condo and don't want to put solar panels on the roofs. 
don't want to an array out in the backyard to spoil their view or something like that, and you're still getting renewable energy and supporting the build out across the state. I just subscribed to one myself, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, actually, I'm going to go to the bike record. I really haven't had that much fear tonight. <laughs> so, recently, a um, project began, a community solar project began just north of the SIUB campus outside of Edwardsville. Uh, this project is being built by a company called Next Amp. It's at the intersection of New Poe Road and 157. This is the campus down here. And Next Amp estimates it's going to have about two and a half megawatt rating. That's pretty sizable. I don't know how much space that is up there. It's uh, in the tens of acres probably. Producing about 3.3 gigawatt hours per year. Well, this is really impressive. More than three quarter million pounds of carbon dioxide emissions reductions per year. That's, that's uh, very impressive. We need to see more of that. So, there are other ones being built as well. These are approved uh, in Amherst territory. There are lots more that you can find online if you care to go online and look up uh, community solar projects through uh, let's see, Illinois Power Agencies. Uh, I've got literature on the table over here about all this stuff, by the way. Uh, Illinois Power Agency site on community solar. They'll list a bunch of projects that you can go and sign up for. I signed up for this one. Oh, I thought I was signing up for that one two weeks ago. My solar installation provides only 65% of my power needs. I thought this would be a great way to get the rest of them. Community solar. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the 15 minute process of reading the literature and then signing the paper uh, was very easy. There were no fees and uh, there were no termination uh, fees or anything like that. It's just going to be a bill for my Ameren uh, statement. And they tell me I'll be paying only 80%, give or take, of what I currently pay now for the power that I get from Ameren. So it sounds like a great deal to me. It remains to be seen how well it's going to work. It's going to be uh, many months, maybe the end of the year before this project is finished. Actually, they, they told me that they're not assigning me to that array. They're assigning me actually to the one all the way on the other side of the state in all night. I don't care. I'm still getting solar power one way or another. Maybe indirectly. That's okay. So if you want to learn more about it, you can go to this website, Illinois Shines. Find a community solar project and find examples in the territory you're in, if it's Amherst, hopefully it's Amherst. And then, just for grants, uh, for, not, for tonight's presentation of my own education, I went through and I calculated, well, what does all this mean in terms of a full-size power plant, like we talked about earlier, with a nuclear power plant, one gigawatt, right? Or a coal-fired power plant of about one gigawatt? Well, it turns out, as massive as this array is, it's going to produce maximum power output of a quarter of 1% of what one of those power plants will produce. A quarter of 1%. Across a year, it will produce 1 20th of 1% of what a nuclear power plant or coal-fired power plant will produce. And, you know, as I was doing these, I double-checked the numbers, I triple-checked the numbers, and it felt to me like I was kicking myself in the crotch. Because here I am a solar advocate and I'm undercut undercutting my argument, right? Uh, but what I what I hear is maybe the unvarnished truth. This is how it works. And oh by the way, we need a hell of a lot more of this stuff, is the bottom line. We'll see some more numbers like that as we go through this. Not not to put out your uh, enthusiasm, not to suppress your enthusiasm. Hopefully, though, to help build your interest in making sure that we get more of this out there and understanding that it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of perseverance. On the part of volunteers, like some of us, and folks who reach out to the legislators to uh, advocate for better policies. So let's take it up a notch. This is a bigger project. This is in Alton. This is at the old landfill over there by the mall. This is Route 3 right here. Route 67, Highway 67. Um, this is an old abandoned landfill. It's a landfill that's been uh, covered over with a clay cap. It's 
no longer being used. It's fenced off. It's got grass growing on it. Um, what can you use one of these things for? You can't build on it. You don't want to put a school on it. You don't want to farm it. You don't want to build houses on it, things like that. You can't penetrate that clay cap or you'll allow rainwater in to leach out the contents of that land, right? This is a proposed project. It's not actually a real project. It's a, called a utility scale solar farm. When we put solar on something like this, it's called brownfield solar. The concept applies to any kind of contaminated property, whether it's uh, an industrial site, a dump, maybe an abandoned coal mine, or an abandoned coal fired power plant. What else would you use those things for? Because they're too toxic after they've been contaminated. Even cleaned up by the EPA to their or two EPA standards, you don't want to use them for a lot of things. But this would be a perfect use for them. You can build a solar array on the surface in such a way that it doesn't penetrate the soil. They're on racks, solar panels on racks that come down their weights. So this proposal uh, by the Alton Cool Cities Committee uh, was initially kicked off by a friend of ours called uh, by the name of Nick Pendergrass a relatively recent uh, immigrant here from Washington, D.C., like myself a few years earlier. And he proposes to the Cool Cities Committee. You all are lucky to have a Cool Cities Committee here, by the way. We need more of them around the area doing great work. And they've issued a request for proposals for contractors to compete against that contract. They are getting questions from contractors coming in, so that's good news. There is interest in it. They got approval from the city council to issue that RFP I forgot to mention, so it's all official. They're not winning games going out there and like a couple of wall chairs doing this stuff. We'd love to do that, by the way. But. Um, so it's bigger than that last thing I should do, that community solar. There's enough space here for 10 megawatts of power. 10 megawatts of solar power. Let's do the math on that. How does that compare to a full-scale power plant? Well, it's closer, 1%. So we, we need a lot, a lot more of those too, right? Less than 1% of the annual production of power. Ah, okay. We just need a lot more of those. So, but right now, one of the challenges is we don't have the incentives to make it happen. Last week, the Illinois Power Agency that manages the incentives for all the stuff I've just shown you, they provide incentives based on uh, a fund that they have. That fund's run out unless you're a small uh, user of power who wants to put solar on your home or business less than 10 kilowatts, like many of us have. Mine's about five and a half kilowatts. There's still plenty of money in the budget for that. Anything bigger than 10 kilowatts, we're out of luck until we get the law fixed. Uh, that funds that budget. By the way, um, the SX, there's an acronym I haven't explained yet. Solar Renewable Energy Credits. Those are incentives uh, that the state of Illinois uses to help fun to build out solar power, whether it's on your property or something like this, or what's going on at the schools, excuse me, or in the parks. That fund that pays for those incentives uh, comes from taxpayers, uh, taxpayers, excuse me, ratepayers like us, every one of us who live in Emerald Territory City, in the investor-owned utility company territories, not the co-ops, not the municipal power companies. But all of us who live in Ameren or Tom Head or some other utility investors are paying about a buck a month into the fund for the incentives to build this stuff out. So I meant to ask this question earlier. How many of you are actually getting solar power through the grid? Everybody should be raising their hands unless you're in co-op territory. Maybe. Because you really are. Uh, whether it's from my, my array or Chris's array or something bigger, um, that power is going out on the grid, and anybody in Ameren territory right now is helping to pay for that uh, to make that possible. But money's out, so whether this will actually get built remains to be seen. So, we actually transition into smaller scale kinds of things, uh, kind of maybe out of sequence, but that's okay. Chris and Virginia and I and a few other volunteers represent the Grow Solar Metro East campaign. It is uh, led by a nonprofit called the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Uh, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, like the other association I'm a member of, is all about promoting renewable energy. 
one of the MRMA programs is to promote solar through these bulk purchase programs. The bulk purchase programs rely on volunteers like us to get the word out, to do presentations, to get um, word out of newspapers, and by various means, to get more people involved. The more people we get involved with this program, the lower the price to the individual homeowner or the business or the nonprofit, whatever. We've been going since about 2016. That first year was led entirely by volunteers that Godfrey they did not have the support of the MREA for money for advertising and things like that. Virginia back here was one of those volunteers and she's losing her hand. Well, I just wanted to say too, you mentioned cool cities. Well, they the Godfrey Climate Protection Committee, which is the Godfrey Cool Cities, they are the one that um, that got the ball rolling on that. So Nate Keener was chairing the committee at that time so um, it was really successful for that grassroots effort and then um, in the next year in 2017 uh, that's when the partnership with Midwest Renewable Energy but um, so you know like Kevin said these cool cities initiatives around the area are really important in getting these sustainability efforts off the ground. Yep, volunteering matters. It really is moving us forward in a lot of ways in various towns and communities around the area around right Virginia. And volunteering for the Sierra Club is important too. We've got a lot of volunteers for this organization like Craig here and who manages the, the hikes and things like that, right? And other, other things. A lot of stuff doesn't get done without volunteers. Um, so anyway, this program has been going strong for five years and growing every year. Uh, you see the first year we had 14 sales, the next year about 38 homes and businesses went solar, and the next year 60. The name of the program has changed every year as we grew the program to encompass more territory. By 2017 it was all of Madison County, and then Metro East later, uh, and full Metro East later, well, full Metro East, all the three counties, Madison, St. Clair, and Monroe down by Columbia. Last year, our, uh, we didn't grow as much as we hoped, and I blame that on the um, tariffs that are driving up, keeping the cost of solar panels artificially high from overseas. Now, there's, there's good in that, and that we're trying to promote domestic production of solar energy equipment. There's bad in that, and that it's really slowing down our build out of renewable energy infrastructure. It's a maybe an unintended consequence. So you can see our amount of power that uh, we're getting out there has grown a lot. And I think I skipped over the fact that what we do as volunteers working with the MREA is we have a competitive bid process where we hire a very qualified contractor every year who is required to give a uh, base sales price for installing solar for a very basic package. That base price is required by our program to be below that vendor's, that below that contractor's normal baseline price outside the program. And then there are volume discounts as we get uh, we, we certain kilowatt hour thresholds, or excuse me, kilowatt thresholds of sales, so that uh, there's a one percent discount, a two percent discount, three percent. And this year there's going to be a four percent discount, uh, depending on how many folks decide to go solar for the program. So, um, and as I said. It's, we always hire a very qualified vendor this year. We have yet to finish that process. We're working on that now. We'll hope to begin our first presentations the middle of April. I think I'm doing the first presentation here in mid-April for this program. So um, if you're interested, you can learn more about that program there. We have literature on the table up here, too, to point in the right direction. And I have a sign-in sheet that uh, you can sign in on so we can reach out to you and let you know when we're talking about this program. The estimates are all free. That's a requirement of the program. There are no obligations and there's no strings attached. Uh, the vendors have been in the past when we hired have been very reliable, very honest, and no, I'm not being paid for any of that. So, click, click. Okay, this, um, this character here may look familiar to you. He's gone solar with this program a couple of times now, repeat customer, repeat offender. However, when you look at Chris Cruza, um, that's his house, his first installation there. So we've helped about 175 people total, and that there are some repeat customers in there. 
And how does that equate to a nuclear reactor or a coal-fired power plant? Yeah, okay, you get the point. We've got a lot more of these to do. The MRA uh, hosts or sponsors programs like this all across the Midwest. Uh, there are other organizations out there doing similar things to what we're doing. The hope is the more of us get involved, we increase these numbers and those numbers, right? So, um, yesterday I got curious, or maybe it was last week, I got curious and wondered, okay, how about all the Metro East solar installations that were approved for this incentive program from the Illinois Power Agency for uh, solar? in 2019. Um, so I, I went on the map, I pulled down the data, it was kind of laborious, went through all the zip codes they have. It's, it's online, by the way, you can go look up this interactively and see how many projects are type by zip code, even by the legislative district. If you want to see how many are in Shipkiss's district or how many are in Boston's district, you can take that and say, look here, Mr. Boss, we had this many solar projects going on last year and we need to continue this. Uh, if you're interested in helping us do some lobbying to talk about the importance of solar power. So we had about 225 projects, solar projects in Metro East in 2019. For about 18 and a half megawatts total. That's a substantial increase, by the way, over previous years. Even though these numbers, you know, make it look small, this is huge compared to previous years. Compared to a nuclear reactor, a little less than 2% in one year. But if we do it year after year, and get enough of the rest of the state involved, we'll get where we want to go eventually. So this all made me curious. How much space do we need to, for solar power in Illinois? We put it all in one place. Any guesses out there? What if we wanted 100% of our power in Illinois from solar power? All right? Any guesses? Yes, I mean, Scott says the whole state. The whole state? No, it's not quite that much. <laughs> so, um, there are 102 counties, I think, 102 or 108, I'm not that. Um, any guesses in terms of how many counties you have to cover? Average county is 5,000, I think, square miles. All right, well, won't keep you in suspense. It would take the entire Metro East and then some, about 10 or 11 counties if we want to do 100%. And that, that doesn't allow for roads or anything, that's just paths in between them and using the standard rule of thumb in the industry of a, a quarter of a megawatt per acre. And I, again, I calculated this over and over again, and I felt like I was kicking myself in the crotch as a new one in the right? But facts are facts. So, okay, what if we, 100% is not realistic at all. What if we go out wind as well and that 50%? It's still you know, pretty sizable now. Um, Madison, St. Clair, Monroe, Jersey, and uh, Coupon counties. Well, Coupon, that's not right. What is that? Calhoun County. Calhoun County, yeah. Roughly it's all over there, 50%. Well, but you think about how Germany did it on rooftops. Yep. And there's a lot of rooftops where, you know, I mean, that's how you kind of achieve that. And that's one of the caveats to solar is it takes room. Yep. For you know, for those modules to be set out and get get the right orientation, but yeah, um, there's other ways to do it than just putting them out in fields. Exactly. Thank you. I was that's quite the direction I was going. Okay. I didn't pay Virginia for that contract, <laughs> um, but I owe her a beer. Um, so yeah, rooftops going to be important. We need to get them off the ground. We don't want to cover up all of our farms. We want to cover up nature, right? We want to be able to enjoy um, nature out there. And, oh, by the way, we do have lots of old industrial sites, old coal mines, old coal waste pits, and on and on and on that we could use as well. So uh, this is merely for perspective. It's not anything more than that. Um, and, oh, by the way, even if we did encourage farmers to put them on farms, that's a great thing for a farmer because the farmer earns a little bit of lease money that helps him maintain a stable income across the year when the crop prices are going like this. Well, that's a good thing for farmers if they choose to do that, but we don't want to cover up all our farm. So, just a reminder, this is what it looks like. We've got a whole lot, of, whole lot to combat there with the fossil fuel generation. And my contention, again, being um, 
yes, a, a renewable energy advocate and an environmentalist is that we need to get rid of this stuff before we worry about this stuff too much. I, I think that we're probably going to need to see this stuff continue for decades to come because of the amount of work we've got ahead of us to build out that renewable energy infrastructure. So uh, I talked about the funding and the incentives for all this stuff. This is what the Illinois Power Agency put out that looks uh, that shows the uh, expenditures for that incentive program. You see, after 2020 it falls off a cliff, that money's already been allocated. Last week they issued a press release saying that money's all gone, folks. And so there's no more for several years. It's a little bit out years as they accumulate stuff from that one dollar per rate payer per month for the fund at current rates. And this is what the build out looks like. It takes a year or two to actually build out an infrastructure like that community solar, like that uh, solar on the schools or whatnot that all that funding pays for. So we'll see, we'll continue seeing some of this build out for the next year, year and a half, maybe two, and after that it goes to almost nothing. That those little bars for guys like you and me putting solar on their house because there's plenty of budget for that for the foreseeable future. That part remains. What doesn't remain is perhaps the money too for solar for all, solar for all, the program that's funded through these incentives that provides uh, solar incentives for people in poorer neighborhoods, neighborhoods uh, that have been impacted by the fossil fuel economy. Uh, that are down with the fossil fuel plants, things like that. Or folks who need training to get into this solar energy business, transitioning out of the coal business. For example, all that's at risk. So yeah, there's that cliff. And the IPA estimates will only get about half of our goal by 2025 at current rates of expenditures or funding. So what to do about it? Well, we need to fix the legislation. The Future Energy Jobs Act passed in 2016 uh, did a pretty good job. It helped us begin this process of building out a renewable energy infrastructure, um, but. Formula for funding it wasn't quite right. It needs to be fixed. One of the solutions is the PAP 100 Act. There are the bill numbers. I got some literature on the table over here. We're going to learn more. I won't go into details now. Um, and then, whoops. There's another bill called the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Several of us in this room and others besides who didn't get here tonight have been lobbying for one or the other of these or both. Uh, up in Springfield, talking to our legislators, talking to them in the district or whatever, sending emails, making phone calls to say we need a renewable energy uh, fix. We need a renewable energy bill to fix the 2016 bill in terms of funding or whatever. The Clean Energy Jobs Act here, I'm not as well versed on as other people are in this room, but it has uh, a whole lot of great provisions for eco justice for those communities that have been. Uh, harmed by polluting fossil fuels, things like that, jobs training programs. And it has electric transportation um, measures as well as measures for funding research into batteries, energy storage on the grid that we desperately need for the renewable energy building. PAC 100 is a little more conservative and it just, it mostly seeks to just fix the funding mechanism. It does tweak some other things associated with the Long, not really as ambitious as broad reaching as the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Half the 100 only seeks to get, I think, to 40% renewables by 2030, if I remember right. Clean Energy Job has the ultimate goal of getting to 100% uh, by, by year. 2050? Sorry? 50? 50, 2050. Right. Thank you. So, um, my, my own feeling as a uh, someone who's gone out and talked to some of the legislators and have been doing this for years uh, is that there's going to have to be some kind of compromise uh, between these and we'll see what that looks like. It might not look like either of these bills. Or it might look like an entire home and all that sausage is made behind those doors. But if you'd like to help, you can join us in the lobby in Springfield. They just sent a couple buses up last week uh, for the Clean Energy Job Act. I went up two or three weeks before that. On my own to work with my SDA, I'm passing 100 bill, lobbying for that. You can write your legislator, you can call your legislator, and we got some literature on the table for both of those bills over here, by the way. And Don has something he's waiting in the back. More literature on the CJ? 
Yeah, it's a petition procedure. A petition, for, petition procedure. All right, thanks, Todd. So, all right, I'll move to that a lot quicker than I thought it would. Well, in summary, I want to, I'd like us all to be excited about our progress. I think we've made a lot of progress, and I hope you agree. All these, all the solar on the schools, and solar in the parks, and solar in uh, the fire stations, and, and whatnot, and now community solar, and hopefully this big utility scale thing on the old landfill. Good stuff. And we do have lumps in the road. Sooner or later it's going to get fixed, I'm sure. I just don't know how soon. I don't know what the answer really looks like. And really, we need everybody on board, as Virginia pointed out. Yeah, not just put it on rooftops. We need to get it off the ground. We don't want it on farmland. We don't want it in our parkland. You know. um, best is if we can get everybody on board with the park. If you can't afford to put solar on your home, if you can't afford to uh, uh, make that investment, think about community solar, getting that through your power bill, uh, if you live in the Amherst territory, or changing your energy provider. Ever, uh, and the other major power companies are required by law to allow you to choose who actually produces your power for you, who you buy your power from. Cameron does not produce its own power. They are banned by law from doing that. So you have that choice. And you can, in some cases, choose a renewable energy company from other uh, providers like Constellation, Ambit, I forget the other names. You might have heard some horror stories about some of the sales tactics by these guys going door to door. I won't defend that. Oh, it sounds pretty atrocious. Uh, I think ultimately in the end, uh, if you want to know energy, and get your hands on it, that's a great thing. Those programs, no extra costs, no fees, no, as far as I know, no hidden fees, no termination fees, and stuff like that. So, and then lastly, perseverance matters. It takes us all to get on board, and uh, I, I hope, hope you can play some role. So, thank you for your attention. I, Appreciate it, and uh, thanks for your support for renewable energy and conservation.